sometimes I just have to keep pressing it until they're both sync until like this. So press that one instead of this one. Okay. That was okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. I guess it works. Thanks. I have to click or it's already working? It's already okay, good. good. Oh, yeah, okay, very good. I think you probably need to put a little bit higher. No? I'm sorry? Do you think you need to put a little bit higher? No. Uh, you mean higher volume? No, over here. Like, um, should be Oh, higher? Yeah. I don't think it makes much of a difference. No. Okay. It's okay. Okay, great, great. But uh, if we take a break, shall I leave it on or? Uh, they could edit it anyway, so I don't think it really matters. Yeah, so we can leave it on. Uh, Simpler, right? Like no, 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 no. But you can show me how do I. Uh, you pause it? Just like you it. Here? Yep. Yeah? Yep. And then I reopen it. Yeah, which is here? No, here. This one. This one. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. So now I can go to where to Google. Yeah, okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, Amanda's here. I think she yeah, Amanda's here. Sure. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, Jorong. Hi, hi. Uh, we might. Uh, I think we have one session uh, before the exam, after this one, right? Yeah. No? Really? Well, it's supposed to be challenging. It is very challenging. <laughs> That's good. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, uh, but uh, we'll let's talk about it. But I think we have uh, uh, the the answer on whether we will review selected questions in class depends. I think we have a session uh, before the exam after this one. Two more. So, uh, so the answer is in that case the answer is yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, but when you look at the answers, does that become clear? What is a random question? Oh, okay. Well, let's uh, let's discuss them. It's a good idea. So, next session we'll start getting to the review. Okay? Sure. you pass those two, please, it's section 10 and 11. Uh, attendance list for 10 and 11 go around, so pick uh, your section and uh, sign your name on it. Thank you. Okay, our subject uh, today is budgeting. Now, we all met budgeting before. Many of us in our business lives, most of us or all of us in our personal lives. Actually, from a young age, most kids start getting allowances, weekly allowances. And weekly allowances are, of course, a form of a budget. And what is the purpose of those weekly allowances? We all know. One of them is resource allocation. Some resources of the family are allocated for the discretion of the kids. Another purpose is to teach the kids how to implement some of their personal plans and execute them with the allowances that they're getting. And then Control and performance evaluation. Having them control themselves and see that they don't go out of budget and what happens if they do. So most of us encounter budgets from a young age. Of course, we're going to focus on budgets in business. And one way to look uh, at budgets in business enterprises is to say that a good budget is not a standalone uh, phenomenon, but it's part, integral, integral part of the business planning of the organization. So if we think about the following stages here of the business planning of an enterprise, starting with the mission or the missions of the organization. The missions are translated into objectives. The objectives, as you know, are translated into operational goals. And uh, then the next stage is devising strategies and courses of action to implement, to reach those goals. So the next stage is st strategies. Now, once you get to the strategy stage, you have to consider resources because the strategies outline activities to reach the goals. As we know, activities require resources. So as we get to the resources, of course, we get to budgets in the planning stage. and. One way then to view, I think a useful way to view budgets, is that the budgets in business settings 
are quantifications of business plans. So you come to a point where you have to quantify your plans. You have to ask yourself, if I undertake certain strategies, how much revenue will be generated? How many costs will be incurred? What will be the profit implications? Once you get into these questions, you're obviously into budgeting. Now, as we said, some of the major roles of budgets, first of all, of course, quantification of business plans, and then, of course, Another role that they play is obvious is resource allocations because resources are allocated according to budgets. And then of course there is the control and the performance evaluation stages where actual results are compared to budgeted targets and variations, variances or deviations are assessed. So that's the control stage. And on the basis of that, performance of different units is evaluated. And given the control and the performance evaluation, the next stage is to consider whether we need corrective actions. If in certain areas we find that we are off targets, of budgets, right? So obviously what is called for is a set of corrective actions to get us back on course. And those corrective actions can go back to amending strategies or even going back to change, changing operational goals, objectives, and in extreme cases, modifying missions. So the budget and the planning cycle, the budget is part of a planning cycle, and this is an ongoing process. And as we say here, all phases are interrelated and in constant change. So it's just a general picture of where budgets fit in. Now, it may be also useful for us to clarify here, what do we mean by budget figures? Uh, we set budget figures for revenues, we set budget figure for costs, and for contribution margins and profits. What do those figures mean? And again, I find that one good way to look at that is to say that budgets combine two elements. First of all, they could be viewed as targets because, as we said, budgets are quantifications of business plans. So you quantify your objectives and your targets, your strategies. So it's useful to look at budget figures as representing targets for action, targets for achievement. But the other element is also that budgets are forecasts. Why? Because if you say that they're only targets, so targets is where we want to go. But if we only stay with what we want, we may easily lapse into what we call in everyday language wishful thinking, right? We can lapse into targets that are nice to achieve, wonderful to achieve, but may not be obtainable. So the targets have to be tempered by reality which means that the budgets have to be targets that are anchored in what is possible and therefore the forecast element, we forecast what is also possible to achieve 
and we compare what is possible with what is desirable. So what is possible is captured by forecasts, good forecasts, realistic forecasts, hopefully, and what is desirable is captured by targets. So the budget is a combination, budget figures are a combination of what is feasible and what is desirable. And one way to look at it is uh, you marry what is desirable and what is feasible, or you stretch what is feasible a bit, not too much. You, so to speak, stretch what is feasible toward the desirable, but sensibly. So that's, I think, uh, one useful way to look at what budget figures should be. Now, we have various types of budgets. We're going to concentrate on operating budgets, which are budgets that look at operating variables such as revenues and costs over a relatively short period of time, say over the next year. If you do it quarterly or monthly, so over the next four quarters, or maybe five or six quarters, but we are looking at operating budgets and we're going to, the focus is going to be on operating budgets. We are not going to discuss in this course capital budgets, which is budgeting for resources and capacity for much longer periods of time, not because capital budgets and capital budgeting is unimportant, it's very important, but because it is, uh, or supposed to be, well covered in your corporate finance, in your basic finance course. Have you, you've taken the finance course already, right? So, uh, so you discuss capital budgeting there, I'm sure. So we don't want to repeat that. So we're going to be concentrating here on operating budgets. And uh, we are going to discuss mainly f flexible budgets and static or uh, the two names or and static budgets or master budgets master or static budgets are used interchangeably and flexible budgets so that's going to be our emphasis particularly today so let's start with an example and i chose a car rental company as an example because car rentals are services and uh, it's a simple technology so it is a relatively easy example to follow but it illustrates all the important principles. So let's envision a car rental company that starts a new location. So the resources at, it, at its disposal, they have to have a car fleet, fleet of cars. Uh, they have to have land on which they put the buildings and the garages for maintenance and the parking lots. So land and the buildings. So the car fleet, the land and the buildings are major resources that the car rental company operates with. And um, we're going to consider car, and of course, the other resources, the most important resources are the human resources. Among the major human resources are car maintenance employees and sales and administration employees. Okay. Now, as you set your operations, car rental operations at a certain location, uh, one very essential element of planning is estimating demand. That's very essential 
in business planning, you have to know what kind of demand you're going to have for your services. So we have to have a demand analysis. But as we do a demand analysis, we have to be quite specific as to what our output is as a car rental company and how do we measure it. Now, in, in manufacturing, defining the output, conceptualizing the output is easy in many cases, not always. But if you produce uh, refrigerators or chips, so that is your output. That is your physical output. Now, in services, it may be more complex. Of course, a car rental company produces car rental services. But how best to measure the output? So we have to think, what do we mean by car rental services? Car rental services is selling services that give the customers the right to the right for the use of the car for a certain period of time. That's what a car rental is. So one common way to measure it, to measure the output or the activity, is by the number of car days rented per period. So let's say the period is a year. Each car is going to be rented so many days a year, depending on demand. So you multiply the number of days times the number of cars, and you get car days. And car days would be a common output for a car rental company. Same way as we will talk about airlines. So airline services, passenger airline services are usually measured by passenger miles. The number of passengers flown multiplied by the number of miles that these passengers are flown. Where here it's the number of cars that are rented times the number of days that are rented. So we, let's agree to measure the output, the activity, what we do in terms of the number of car days rented. So now we could uh, be more specific about the measures of demand and supply once we agree on what the output and the activity is. Uh, the quantity demanded is easy. That's the number of cars demanded per period. In other words, hopefully we're going to have customers. The customers are going to demand rental, car rental services, because they're customers for car rental services. So they're going to demand so many car days per period. So that would be the quantity demanded. Now, on the supply side, uh, we have to provide the capacity. That is, we have to ask ourselves how many car days we can provide. We have to install the capacity by buying or leasing a car fleet, fleet of cars. And let's see how we measure the supply. Well, let's start the capacity. Well, let's start by theoretical capacity. And we'll see in a moment why we call it theoretical capacity. Theoretical capacity is the number of cars that we have in our fleet the number of cars that we have in our fleet times the number of days per period. So theoretically, if we talk the period is a year, so each car that we have in our fleet theoretically can be rented 365 days a year if there is a demand for this car to be rented 365 days a year. So 
the number of cars times 365 days will be the annual theoretical capacity. Well, why is it theoretical? Because in theory, ideally, you can have all those cars for 365, but practically, it's very unlikely. Why? Because cars need maintenance. Cars can break down. So, in terms of the number of days available per car, you have to adjust the theoretical capacity to practical capacity by subtracting the number of days, subtracting from the theoretical capacity, 365 days a year, the number of days a year that a car is going to be tied in to maintenance and maybe to repair. Okay, so uh, we have to go from theoretical capacity to practical capacity. Where practical capacity is theoretical capacity minus downtime minus maintenance time. Okay, let's get into the numbers of this example. For this car location, let us assume that you plan to purchase a fleet of 100 cars, and you're going to purchase them. So the budgeted car days and the budgeted car days available, that's the practical capacity, you estimate to be at 100 cars times 350 car days per car available. Why 350? Because in this example you say per year we have 365 days. I estimate that on the average a car will be tied in to maintenance and repair 15 out of those 365 days. So subtract from 365, 15, <coughs> excuse me, and you get 350. So in this example, the practical capacity, budgeted car days available are 100 times 350 or 35,000 car days available. So that's what you have available as capacity. Now, the other thing is to estimate demand. <coughs> how many cars in your planning, how many cars do you think would be, how many car days do you think would be demanded? And in this example, the estimate is that on the average, each car in your fleet is going to be demanded for rental 300 days a year. So the budgeted car, the budgeted car days rented, as opposed to available, the demand is going to be 100 times 300 days per car on the average total 30,000 car days. So you can ask yourself, well, if you, as if you expect a demand of 30,000 car days a year, why do you prepare a capacity of 35,000 car days? And the answer is because we operate in a world of uncertainty. We forecast, we do the best of a good forecast of demand of 30,000 car days, but we don't know for sure. The demand may be lower, but it also may be higher. And if we do not want to be caught without cars, customers come to us and there are no cars, we may budget for a higher capacity in a particular, than we think a demand would be in a particular period. 
So that's why we could have the discrepancy between what is demanded and what is made available. We can also budget, and we'll see, I'm not sure we'll use it in this example, we can budget the average miles that we think will be driven per rented car day. And let's assume that that is estimated at 200 miles on the average driven per car per day. Okay, uh, any questions about the demand and capacity and supply figures in this example? Yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Let's do that. You do? Thank you very much. I forgot to do that. It's much easier because it doesn't, it eliminates the glare. Okay, thanks. Okay. Let's go into uh, budgeted costs. In this example, we acquired the cars. We purchased the cars. The acquisition or the purchase price is estimated to be $25,000 per car. And the cost of capital of the firm is uh, seven point, estimated at 7.2%. So the budgeted car price is $25,000. And the budgeted opportunity cost, that's the cost of tying up. If you pay, the uh, assumption is that you pay cash for the car, so you tie $25,000 per car cash. Per 100 cars, it's $25,000 per car times 100 cars. So that's the amount of cash that you tie in. And uh, if you assume that your best alternative return equals to your cost of capital, so you multiply it by 0 0.072 and you get $180,000, the opportunity cost of tying your funds to the purchase of this fleet of 100 cars. Now, if uh, you estimate that the price of a car at the end of the first year, given the usage that you estimate will be 22,000, then the budgeted economic depreciation for the coming year per car is going to be the difference between 25,000 and 22,000 which gives you 3,000. And um, the total budgeted depreciation is going to be 3,000 per car times 100 cars. Uh, and that's going to give you $300,000 total budgeted depreciation for the period. Now, if the budgeted depreciation per for car for the coming period is 3,000. And we estimate that the demand for on the average per car is going to be 300. So the budgeted car depreciation per day rented is going to be 3,000 divided by 300 or $10 depreciation per car day. And you can also do the budgeted car depreciation estimated per miles driven. It's ten day ten dollars per day if the estimated mileage driven is two hundred miles. So it's uh, five cents per mile driven. So that's uh, a major cost of operating the fleet is depreciation, and we estimated that to be. Uh, the major figure that we're going to use here is $10 per car day rented. Okay, any questions? So you see, if you use economic depreciation, you could uh, reasonably say that the economic depreciation is a variable cost because it depends, 
it depends in a major way on usage and therefore it varies with usage and it's a variable cost. Ten dollars per car day. Okay, we have to look at maintenance as another major cost of uh, operating the fleet is maintenance. So we have to estimate uh, the maintenance core, uh, per car. So we go to our technical people and ask her, given the, uh, given the, of course these are new cars, given the uh, brand of car that we're going to buy, the make, what, and given the mileage we anticipate in using, what do you think estimate is going to be the yearly maintenance? And let's assume that they come up with a $600 figure. So the total budget and maintenance, 600 per car, 600 times $160,000 maintenance budget. Now, uh, the budgeted car maintenance per day rented, it's $600 per car. A car is estimated to be in demand 300 days a year, so per day rented, $600 divided by 300 days, so it's going to be $2 per car day. And uh, we also have to estimate or budget for the compensation per hour that we are going to pay for maintenance people. And uh, we go to our labor experts, uh, our human resources people, who hire those people and survey the markets, and they come with an estimate of 20 dollars per car day compensation for a maintenance worker. Okay, let's pause and see if there are any questions about the meaning of the numbers. Okay, let's move now to the budgeting, budgeting the costs. So, let's denote some numbers. Why would be the number of car days, number of car days rented, and VC will stand for variable cost. The VC for depreciation is going to be $10 depreciation per car days times the number of car days, so it's 10 times Y. And the variable cost of maintenance is going to be $2 per car day maintenance estimated, the budgeted, times Y. Y is the number of car days. The fixed cost is the opportunity cost because the opportunity cost is the cost of tying in the funds, so it doesn't vary with activity, so it's a fixed cost. And we have estimated the opportunity cost based on the cost of capital to be $180,000. So the total cost is the fixed cost, which is $180,000, times the variable cost. That's the, fix, that's the total cost of operating the fleet. There are other costs, selling an administration and so on. But the total cost of operating the fleet is the 180,000 opportunity cost plus the variable costs of depreciation and maintenance. Now depreciation is 10y and maintenance is 2y, so 10y plus 2y is 12y and 12y is the variable cost component and the total cost function in this case is 180 plus 12y. So if you want to fit the cost function that is uh, specify how you expect, that's all in planning, a budgeted cost function, how you expect the total cost of operating the fleet to vary 
with the activity level, the number of car days, given the estimates that we have, you come up with this linear function, 180,000 plus 12y. Okay? Okay, let's go to budgetary analysis. Uh, so, we know that we, based on our demand forecast, we budget that 30,000 car days would be bought. So, why budgeted is 30,000 car days. Now, let's assume we go into operation and we go throughout the year and we rent those cars. At the end of the year, we have an actual figure because customers came in, cars were rented, and then we can record how many cars were actually rented. And it's given here that the Y actual, in this example, is 25,000 car days. So what happened in this particular year, we, the car rental company in the new location, planned, budgeted, to sell 30,000 car days. But it turned out that the demand was lower than expected and therefore it sold only 25,000 car days. So now uh, we have several budgeted figures. Well, we first of all have uh, the budgeted total cost for operating the fleet. MAST, but BUD stands for budgeted. MAST stands for the master budget. So the master budget for operating the fleet, that was the figure that you budgeted for before the operations. And there's the budgeted opportunity cost, fixed cost of 180,000, plus the budgeted variable costs per unit of depreciation 10 and maintenance 2, 10 plus 2 is 12, times what volume the budget was predicated that was before we knew what the actual was. The budget was predicated, the budget of operating the fleet was predicated on 30,000 car days because we thought our demand forecast, the best demand forecast that we had said that we hope to sell, we think we would sell 30,000 car days. So multiplied by 30,000 gives you a master budgeted 540,000. Now we measure the actual costs of operating the fleet at the end of the year and they come out to be, they're recorded in this example as 520,000. So we budgeted for 30,000 car, car days we actually sold 25,000. We budgeted in operating the fleet for $540,000. We actually spend 520,000. So that's the story so far. Now, we are about to introduce uh, a somewhat unusual concept. So far, things are straightforward. So the master budget is straightforward. It's what is predicated based on the budgeted costs and the budgeted volume of the number of car days sold. Now we introduce another budget figure, another budget concept, which is called the flexible budget. Flex stands for flexible. Of course, BUD stands for budget. Now, what is the flexible budget? The flexible budget is a budget that is adjusted for how many car days we actually sold, for our actual level of activity. 
So in a flexible, in setting a flexible budget, we ask ourselves the following question. If in the planning stages, had we known in the planning stages that we would have sold 25,000 car days, how much we would have budgeted for? Because we didn't know. We thought we would sell 30,000 car days thought we would sell 30,000 car days. So obviously because of that, the master budget was based on 30,000. But had we know, had we had the crystal ball and known that we would sell 25,000 car days, how much we would have budgeted for the operation of the fleet? Well, the fixed cost remains 180,000, but the variable cost would be the $12 Budget vari budgeted variable cost per unit times 25,000 car days because we sold only 25,000 car days. So the flexible budget would then be a different figure. It will be 180,000 plus 12, but not times 30,000, which was the, the uh, level of activity, the number of car days we planned on but the actual number of car days we sold. So the flexible budget is a budget adjusted for actual activity and in this example will be $480,000. Yes? Oh, no, that's just uh, part of the story. We, uh, at the end of the year, we measured the costs of operating the fleet, that is, the opportunity cost plus the uh, depreci actual depreciation costs, right, plus the actual maintenance cost, and we came up with $520,000. So that's uh, simply given by the story. Okay, but the question is, Is it clear what we mean by the flexible budget? Now, the flexible budget is flexible. It's called flexible because it varies according to the actual number of car days sold or the actual level of activity. So if the actual level of activity will, would have turned out to be 28,000, so the flexible budget will have a 28,000 figure here and would be a higher number. If it happened that we plan to sell 30,000 car days, but we actually sold 34,000 car days, so the actual budget would have a $34,000 figure. The flexible budget would have a $34,000 figure here. So you can see what the flexible budget does. It adjusts for it asks what would have been the budget had we known, had we known what the actual level of activity is. And most companies do, of course, the master budget, but most companies also do flexible budgets. And you ask yourself, why, why? Okay, we, uh, we get the concept, but why do we need it? Why do we need flexible budgets? So what are flexible budgets good for managerially? And that's the next thing that we're going to discuss. But before we get to the discussion of why flexible budgets, why the computation of flexible budgets is useful, and having them is useful, uh, let me just pause and see if uh, it's clear for everybody what the flex what the flexible budget means and how it's computed I'm sorry yeah exactly that's what you're doing you're adjusting it for the actual so uh, you say but you're adjusting it for the actual in a way that the $12 here remain the budgeted figures. They're the $10 per depreciation per car days plus the $2 budgeted maintenance per car day. The $180,000 remain also the budgeted figure, but the only figure 
that you replace with an actual is uh, you, instead of having the budgeted level of activity of car days, you have the actual level of activity of car days. That's what... It's flexible in terms of adjusting for the actual level of activity. Okay, uh, so when we get to the end of the period, at the end of the year, we have budgeted figures and we have actual figures. And of course, naturally what we do, we ask ourselves, how are we doing? Now, how are one straightforward answer to the question how we are doing is comparing the actual performance to the budgeted result. In this case, the actual cost performance to the budgeted costs. So we compare actual to budgeted and the differences, the deviations of the actual figures from the budgeted figures are called in management accounting variances. They're actually deviations, they're differences. But for some reason, some unfortunate reason, <laughs> they're called variances. The reason it's unfortunate that they're called variances is because some people or many people are likely at the beginning to confuse them with statistical variances. And accounting variances, budget variances, let me assure you, have nothing to do with statistical variances. Statistical variance are measures of the dispersion of a distribution, and you know how to calculate the variance in the standard deviation. Accounting variances are simply differences or deviations, and I would love to call them deviations, but uh, in the accounting parlance they're called variances, so so that's what they are. So we are now calculating the variances. Now, with respect to the operating the fleet, the cost of operating the fleet, we have now three numbers. We have the master budget, 540,000. We have the actual costs at the end of the year, 520,000, and we have the flexible budget at 480,000. So given these figures, we can calculate three variances, and they're calculated here. First of all, that's what is very straightforward, is the master budget variance. The master budget variance is simply the difference between the actual cost of operating the fleet of 520,000 and the master budget of 540,000. And the difference is between the two is $20,000. Now, uh, the other important thing to internalize here in variance analysis is that every variance that we compute in accounting, in management accounting, we designate the variance as either favorable, which is denoted by the letter F, or unfavorable, which is denoted by the letter U. So you have to be very clear, what is the criterion that we use in deciding whether a variance is favorable or unfavorable? And that's easy. There's only one criterion, and it's one clear criterion. The impact of the variance on profits. The criterion is the impact of the variance on profits. 
if the impact of the variance on profits is positive, then the variance is favorable. And if the impact of the variance on profits is negative, then the variance is unfavorable. So it's either a favorable impact on profits or an unfavorable impact on profits. Now here, with the master budget variance, it's easy because other things being equal, if we budgeted, our master budget was 540,000 and we came under budget, the actual cost were 520,000, so we came $20,000 under budget. Well, if cost-wise, we come $20,000 under budget, what's the impact on profits? Obviously, it's positive, right? Because we came with a lower cost than we budgeted. So other things being equal, it has to have a positive impact on our profits, and therefore, we designate the variance, the master budget variance, as favorable. Okay, let's move to the other variances which are less uh, straightforward, require a little bit more explanation. We can calculate the flexible budget variance which would be the difference between the actual costs, 520,000, excuse me, and the flexibly budgeted costs of 480,000. And numerically, that gives you a variance of 40,000. So what we're saying here in the flexible budget variance uh, we actually incurred a cost of 520000 But had we known that we would sell only 25,000 car days, we would have budgeted 480000 So, based on this flexible budget, our actual costs came higher than the flexibly budgeted costs. And whenever actual costs come higher than budgeted costs, in and of itself, this has an unfavorable impact on profits. Therefore, we are going to designate uh, the variance, the flexible budget variance here for the total cost of operating the fleet as unfavorable. So the flexible budget variance will be $40,000 unfavorable. Okay, now let's uh, concentrate on those two variances. We'll get to the third variance in a moment. Okay, so as we said, the master budget variance is straightforward. We came under budget and we have a $20,000 favorable variance. Why do we need the flexible budget variance? What does the flexible budget and the flexible budget variance help us with if we already have the master budget variance? Does the flexible budget variance give us any useful additional information? Because if not, then let's not do it, right? We are not here just to play games. We are here to generate information that is important for us managerially in terms of making decisions, in terms of evaluating, in terms of controlling, and so on. So, any thoughts about why master budget variance alone may not be adequate. What is the problem with the master budget variance? Yes. The 
Right, but why is it a problem? Yeah, no, no, that's by definition, you're right. But why, but why? Why don't you, what, what, uh, what bothers you? Suppose you ha we had only the master budget variants. Clearly something bothers you, and, uh, and, and rightfully so. But yeah, in other words, what you're saying is, if I can elaborate and tell me if uh, I catch your meaning here, is what you're saying is that in the master budget we compare two figures, but the actual figure is based on what? The actual cost figure is based on the actual number of car days that we sold, right? 25,000. So the actual, well, we don't have yet flexible. In the master budget, we just have the actual in the master budget. But the actual 520 are based on what? They're based on 25,000 car days sold because they're the actual, right? But the budgeted $540,000 are based on what? They're based on the number of cars days budgeted. So you might say that we are comparing here apples and oranges, right? We compare actual costs that are based on actual number of car days sold, and we compare them to budgeted costs, which are based on what? On budgeted car days. So uh, we compare 540,000, which is based on 30,000 car days estimated, to 520,000 actual, which is based on 25,000 car days. So that's a problem. Yeah, sure, we came under, but we don't know whether we came under because, whether we came under cost because our cost performance was favorable by incur 520,000 is lower than 540,000. But we don't know whether this favorable performance was the result of lower cost per unit or it was a result of the fact that we sold less car days. Was it lower cost per car day or the fact that we sold less car days? If it was the result of lower cost per car day, then we can say, hi, we're becoming more efficient relative to budget. But if it was just because we sold less car days, that's not a big deal, right? We expect that if we sell less car days, we'll incur less costs because a large part of our cost is variable, depends on the car days. So that figure, the master budget variance is important, but it's not sufficient because we want to know how much of this favorable variance is due to the fact, simply to the fact, that we sold less car days. And that's exactly what the flexible budget variance tells us, because the flexible budget variance doesn't compare apples to oranges, it compares apples to apples. The $520,000 actual cost is based on 25,000 actual car days, and the 480,000 flexibly budgeted cost is also based on 25,000 car days. So now we are comparing two figures based on the same activity level. And now we are coming with a cost performance that is unfavorable. Why? Because had we known that we would sell 25,000 car days, we would have budgeted 480,000 and we would have expected to incur a cost of 480,000, but we incurred a cost of 520,000, so the variance is unfavorable. So in this example, we have the following answer to the question we asked before. The reason our overall cost performance was favorable, we came under budget, is due to the fact that we sold less car days. 
had we budgeted on the basis of sailing less car days, then our variance, then our cost would come over budgeted and our variance is unfavorable. So the unfavorable flexible budget variance tells you that your performance based on cost per car day, actual versus budgeted, was unfavorable. And the only reason your overall cost performance was favorable is because you, sell, you sold less car days than you budgeted for. So that's the reason why it's important to have a flexible budget and why the flexible budget variance gives you additional important information. Yeah. Right. No, there's no difference in the fixed costs because the fixed costs, uh, the fixed costs in both master budget and flexible budget are 180,000. Because the fixed costs, because look, the only difference between the master budget and the flexible budget is the level of activity. Right. But uh, it's a difference in total cost, but it reflects only differences in variable cost. Because if you look, uh, if you look at the two budgeted figures, right, the master budget and the flexible budget, right, both of them are based on the same fixed costs, 180,000. So if you comp so. Whatever your fixed, whatever your actual fixed costs are, and they're different, but in both cases you compare the actual fixed cost to budgeted fixed costs, which are the same. There are 880,000 whether you it's the master budget or the flexible budget. So the difference, the differences between the master budget variance and the flexible budget variance are only due to how you budget the variable costs. So it's a good question. It's a good question. It's a good point to clarify. Okay, any other questions about those two variances? Okay, so we also have a third variance, and the third variance is two names. I prefer the name activity budget variance, where um, Excuse me, just didn't get it on the screen. Activity budget variance, ACTV stands for activity, because it's a variance due to differences between budgeted and actual activity. Uh, but uh, in your textbook, it's called uh, uh, the sales quantity variance or the effectiveness variance. So they have interchangeable names to it. But they all refer to the same variance. And this variance is due, what this variance does, it compares, definition-wise, it compares two budgeted figures. One is the, excuse me, this is the maintenance week. Uh, we got too far. OK, I knew that was it. So it, uh, we're talking about the actual total cost. So it compares two variances. It compares, it compares two budget figures. The master budget figure of 540 to the flexible budget figure of 480. So the activity budget variance is the deviation, measures the deviation between two budget figures. The flexible budget, the master budget, and the flexible budget. So you could see that the flexible, the master budget was 540, the flexible budget was 480, 
And the difference between the two is $60,000, and that's numerically the level of the activity budget variances. So remember, in activity budget variances or sales quantity variances, same thing, we compare two budgeted figures. One is the master budget and the other is the flexible budget. But if we are comparing two budgeted figures, what is the difference? By definition, the only difference is the level of activity. Because the master budget is computed on the basis, bless you, the master budget is computed on the basis of planned level of activity, 30,000 car days, and the flexible budget is computed on the basis of the actual level of activity, 25,000 car days. So the difference between the two is only due to the level of activity. So, now the question is, how do we designate this variance? Remember, the sole criterion is the impact on profits. Now, the reason that this variance the reason for this variance is that we sold less car days than we budgeted. We budgeted 30,000, we sold 25,000 car days. Now, if you sell less than you budgeted, if you sell less than you budgeted, you sell less car days, what's the impact on costs? It reduces costs, right? Because you produce less car days. Other things being equal, in and of itself, if you reduce costs, what is the impact on profits? Favorable. Therefore, the $60,000 variance is designated, activity variance is designated as favorable. So we have now all three variances calculated and we can interpret them managerially. We say, master budget variance, we say, look, overall, we came under costs, under the budgeted costs. The actual cost came under budgeted costs, so there's a favorable impact of $20,000. But the reason we came under cost has to do solely with the fact that we sold less car days. And therefore, the flexible budget variance is unfavorable because it shows that if we adjust it for the number of car days, the actual cost per car day was higher than the budgeted cost per car day. So we're actually cost inefficient compared to what we budgeted for, and therefore we have 40,000 unfavorable. And the activity budget variance simply shows to you, yes, well, we had a much lower actual activity, 25,000 car days versus 30,000 car days, and that had a favorable impact on costs, not surprising. Now the other thing that is important, that in general, when you calculate those three variances, in general you can always show, it is always true mathematically, and those of you who want to check it algebraically, you could do that, it's easy, but it is always true mathematically that if you add the flexible budget variance to the activity budget variance, you will always get the master budget variance. So the flexible budget variance plus the activity budget variance will always give you the master budget variance. Now you want, 
in this particular example, you can see that uh, it holds because the flexible budget variance for the operation of the fleet is 40,000 unfavorable. The activity variance, budget variance is 60 favorable. 40 unfavorable plus 60 favorable gives you what? A net of $20,000 favorable, which is indeed your master budget variance. Or in other words, you can say that you can always partition the master budget variance to two components, the flexible budget variance and the activity budget variance, and the two components will sum up to the total of the master budget variance. Okay? Just to internalize it, let's go over another example. Uh, so far we were focused on the total cost of operating the fleet, let's look at the maintenance costs as another component because you can do this cost analysis for each cost component. Another variable cost component is the maintenance cost. Again, to remind you, uh, the actual number of car days sold are 25,000. Uh, now, the total cost for maintenance, the actual, has been measured given by the story is 64,000. The total flexible maintenance, the total flexibly budgeted maintenance cost is two, well, let's start, the total master budgeted maintenance cost is two dollars per car day, as we calculated before, budgeted maintenance, two dollars per car day, times the planned 30,000 car days, which gives you 60,000. The flexible is what it would have been had we known, what the budget would have been had we known that we would sell only 25,000 car days. Then we would have budgeted at two per car day times 25,000, 50,000. Then the master budget variance is the actual 64,000 minus the master budget, 60,000, gives you 4,000. And it's unfavorable because the actual costs exceed the budgeted costs. The flexible budget variance is uh, actual for the maintenance, 64,000, minus the flexibly budgeted 50,000, gives you 14,000. And obviously, it's also unfavorable because the actual are higher than the flexibly budgeted. And the activity budget variance is the difference between the flexibly budgeted maintenance cost and the master budgeted maintenance cost, which gives you 10,000. And this 10,000 is, has a favorable impact on costs because just by the fact that you the activity budget variance is due only to the difference between the level of activities. And it's always the case that if you produce at a lower level of activity, you will incur less costs. So that will have a favorable impact. And now you could see that if you add the flexible budget variance, 14,000 unfavorable, to the activity budget variance 10,000 favorable, uh, 14,000 unfavorable plus 10,000 favorable gives you a net of 4,000 unfavorable, which is the master budget variance. So you can do the same analysis with any cost component. The example we did here is for the total cost of the fleet and for the maintenance. And that summarized to you what we said before, that in general, the master budget variance equals the flexible budget variance plus the activity budget variance. Okay, uh, any questions about the variances and about the flexible budget concept 
and the interpretation of the variances. So I think that this is heavy material, so we will, let's break for, let's take two breaks this time. Let's break for about 15 minutes now. And uh, what we'll do later, uh, so far, our examples covered variable direct cost, that is the cost of depreciation and the cost of maintenance and the cost of operating the fleet. Next, we'll consider how we budget and analyze the variances for variable overhead. And the variable overhead that we will consider are going to be the selling and administrative costs of this particular car rental company. So we'll talk about that after the break. Let's take a 15 minutes break now. Thanks. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll note that. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, the two signing sheets are going around. So you find for your section.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's reconvene, please. Okay, before we shift to a variable uh, overhead, a variable indirect cost, we'd like to expand our analysis from uh, flexible budgeting uh, to what is known as standard costing. Uh, in management accounting. Now, standard costing, as most cost accounting started from manufacturing, but it spread into services. And let's see what standard costing is all about. As a matter of fact, it's a quite straightforward expansion of the budgetary analysis we considered so far. Let's look at, let's look at it through an example of the direct costs and let's uh, zero in on the maintenance costs of maintaining the fleet of cars that we have been discussing for the car rental company. And essentially what standard costing says is predicated on a simple proposition that if you look, for example, you look at costs, you look at each cost figure and the cost figure, total cost figure for maintenance, let's assume, is composed of a product of two components. The quantity of the input used, in this case, hours of maintenance. Hours of maintenance put by the maintenance employees, the maintenance workers, that's one component. And the other component is the compensation that they're paid, or the price per unit for, per unit of input, in this case, the compensation per person hours. So if you multiply the number of units times the price per unit, you'd get the total cost. So total cost is composed, total cost of each component, such as maintenance cost, is composed of the input times the price per unit. So if you had, if uh, your cost was direct materials, it would be composed, the total cost of direct materials of a certain type of material will be composed of two, of a product of two components. The number, the pounds, the number of units of material to use, for example, pounds of materials, times the price per pound of material. If you multiply those two, you get the total cost. So the idea is very simple. If you have those two components, you could, uh, when you plan, you could set standards for each component separately. You can set standards for the quantity of the input you plan to use, how many units, and you can set a separate standard for how much you plan to pay for each unit of the input that you are hiring or that you're buying. And then you can compare the actuals to the planned or the budgeted figures. And if you do that kind of analysis, it's called standard costing because the targets or the budgets that you set for the units separately and for the prices per unit separately are called standards. But basically, they are planned or budgetary figures. So I think things will become clearer if we go through an example. Let's uh, take the maintenance costs. You remember, we already set a standard, a target, or a standard for before, when we introduced the numbers, for how much we plan to pay per hour of maintenance. So the standard price, the budgeted compensation per main, M-A-I-N period is maintenance, maintenance hour, per maintenance hour, is $20. So your target or your standard is $20. That's what you plan ahead. Now the other standard that you have to set is a quantitative standard. How many hours of maintenance do you plan to use 
given the number of car days that you plan to rent. So you go to your technical people and you ask them per car, it's easier to do per car than per car day, per car, given that cars will be rented 300 days, you expect the cars to be rented each one of them 300 days a year, per car, how many hours of maintenance you expect will be necessary to set a target uh, for the year? And based on technical estimates, they come up with a target, which remember is based on desirability and feasibility, of, uh, in this example, of 25 hours per car. So where do we take the 25 hours per car? It's part of the story. You go the people, you set with your technical people a standard, a standard which is, reflects your goals, but also reflects what is feasible. And it comes to 25 hours of maintenance per car, given how many days you expect to rent each car and how many miles per day on the average you expect the car to be driven. And given what you know about the make of the car and its reliability, and its maintenance requirements and so forth. So it's 25 hours per car day and uh, so how many hours uh, of maintenance is the standard in total? Well you have 100 cars in the fleet, 100 times 25 hours per car is 2500 hours of maintenance. That's your standard. So you have now set two standards for the components of the cost of maintenance, one for the number of hours that you're going to use, given the volume, given the activity level that you anticipate, and the other for the compensation, your target for the compensation per hour of maintenance worked. So these are the standards. That's all there is to it. And you can do it with any cost component. And it's done in many accounting systems for many companies for most cost components for materials, various types of materials, for various types of labor, and so forth. Once you do that, you have standard costing. So you elaborate your standards. Instead of just setting a standard for the total cost of maintenance, you set a separate standard for how many hours of maintenance you plan to use and a separate standard for how much you plan to pay for an hour of maintenance. Okay. Now, you go into operation, and uh, at the end of the year, you have some actual numbers. Turns out that the actual compensation per maintenance hour that you paid was $20, so you're right on target. 20, you planned for 20, and the actual that you paid was 20 in that story. That doesn't happen very often, but it can happen that you're right on target. And the actual maintenance hours worked for the year were 3,200. So considerably higher than what you planned. You planned on 2,500 hours of maintenance. You actually used 3,200 hours of maintenance. So of course now what you do is you compare the actual performance to the budgeted or the targeted figure, figures, and you get variances. And the two additional variances that we get are the efficiency variance and the price variance. Let's start with the efficiency variance. 
the efficiency variance compare, uh, really wants to get a measure, assess the efficiency of the maintenance operation in this company. So it compares the actual number of hours for maintenance to the target, 32 to 2,500, and it dollarizes it to a dollar figure, the dollar impact, by multiplying it by the standard price of an hour of maintenance, which is the standard compensation per hour, which we set to be at $20. So we take the difference of 3,200 and 2,500, 700 hours, and multiply it by $20 and we get $14,000, which uh, assesses the dollar impact of the fact that you exceeded your standard in terms of hours of maintenance worked by 700 hours. And the fact that you exceeded your standard by 700 hours you cost that at the standard price of $20, so it's reflected in an additional $14,000 of maintenance cost. That type of deviation in the quantity standard. And that is called an efficiency variance because it reflects the fact, the reason, the presumed reason the presumed reason, we're not necessarily knowing whether it's correct reason, but the presumed reason that you used more hours of maintenance than you planned for, the presumed reason is a deviation in efficiency. In this case, because you used more hours than you were, tar than you targeted to, you used more hours of maintenance, then uh, the presumption is that you were less efficient than you planned because you used more hours. So if you use less hours, the presumption is that you were more efficient. If you, if you use more hours, you are less efficient. If you lose less hours, you are more efficient. Let's call this an efficiency variance. At least that's the presumption. So, and of course, not surprisingly, the variance is designated as unfavorable, and the reason the variance is designated as unfavorable is uh, straightforward. The fact that you use more hours than you targeted, in and of itself, other things being equal, increased your cost of maintenance, and that has an unfavorable impact on profits, and as a result, the variance is designated as unfavorable. The other variance that you compare is the price variance. And the price here is the price of the input, not the price of the output, the price of the input. Your input is maintenance, so the price of the input is uh, compensation per hour of maintenance. So you compare the actual compensation to the standard. Well, in this case, you were right in target, so 20 minus 20 is 0. And the difference is multiplied by the actual hours of maintenance used, 3,200. Well, 3,200 times 0 is, of course, 0. Because you were right in target, your variance is 0. Had you paid less, say you would have paid $19, then your variance would be 19 minus 20, or 20 minus 19 is 1 times 3,200 will be $3,200, and it would be favorable if you paid less than target, because if you pay less than target for the input, that decreases your cost and has a favorable impact on profit. So, that's the price variance. The price variance reflects the difference between the actual price that you paid for a unit of the input 
in the standard or the target price. So you have the efficiency variance and the price variance. Of course, uh, one thing you probably noticed is something that is curious. When you define the efficiency variance, you multiply, to dollarize it, you multiply the difference in the hours, you multiply them by the standard price, but when you produce the price variance, you multiply the difference in the prices that you pay for the inputs target uh, standard versus actual by the actual quantity of hours so the question is, why here standard and why here actual? And there's no reasonable, there's no logical answer for that. The only answer for that, that if you do it that way, then mathematically, you can then show that if you add the efficiency variance to the price variance, or the price variance to the efficiency variance, you will always get the flexible budget variance for that particular cost component. And since accountants like numbers to sum up, they don't like to explain residuals, so we accountants feel comfortable when variances sum up to a larger variance. If you wanted to sum up, you have to use the actual number of hours here. You could see that uh, price variance zero plus the efficiency variance 14,000 unfavorable gives you the flexible budget variance for maintenance that we calculated before as 14,000 unfavorable. Now, the reason it may not make sense to use these calculations just to achieve uh, a summation here to a larger aggregate is that if you look at the price variance and you ask the purchasing department, well, now in this case, it's not the purchasing, in materials, it will be the purchasing department. In, uh, in uh, maintenance, it would be what? Uh, in labor, it would be the human resources department. If you ask the human resources department to explain the variation between the com actual compensation per hour and the standard compensation per, per hour, that's reasonable. But if you like them to explain the variance, the variance is multiplied by actual number of hours worked. So the, the Human Resources Department can say, look, it's reasonable to ask us why, well, in this case, there's no deviation. But suppose there were a deviation. Suppose they paid $24 per hour, and the standard was 20 in compensation. So say it's reasonable to ask us why we paid. We can explain why uh, we had to pay 24 when we hired those people rather than 20. But what is not reasonable is the second component is to ask us, because if we have to explain the dollar variance, we, you multiply it by 3,200, but 3,200 is the number of hours that were used by, by the maintenance people. We don't know why they used 3,200 hours. That was not our decision, right? We are human resources. Actually, when we asked them, they said that the standard was 2,500 hours. So they expected to be using 25 hours of maintenance. And now you ask us to explain a variance where you multiply it by 3,200 hours. Why they use 700 hours more than they were supposed to? Maybe they had good reasons, maybe not. But how would we know? So actually, it makes sense to have the price variance, uh, also to have the difference in prices multiplied by the 
standard number of hours, 2,500, rather than by the actual number of hours, 3,200. But since we in accounting, in accounting have fascination in adding the numbers up and not trying to explain additional residuals, that's the way it's done. That's, but since in management accounting, again, we are not subject to FASB, so you can reset and redefine the variances any way you want. It's just the common way it's done, right? There's no particular reason to doing it that way. Okay, any questions about standard costing? Okay, we can move to variable overhead variances. And the variable, major variable overhead costs that we have here, the indirect costs, are the cost of sales and administration, SNA. <coughs> what are the SNA costs in a rental company? Well, that's the cost of employing, uh, remember, in addition to maintenance people that work on your cars, you have to have the people in the office that sell, that sell the rentals, right? and to do the accounting, and those are the sales and admin people. So let's see how we do their costing. Okay, uh, let's go through an example. The master budget total for S&A costs is 240,000, it's given, it's part of the story, it's not uh, derived in any way. And when you go to actual operations, by the end of the year, it's given that you spent on SNA $270,000. So these are the given numbers. Now, in budgeting, you want to have a budgeted or predetermined, predetermined is ahead of operation, variable overhead allocation rate, which is calculated as the ratio as dividing the muster budgeted total SNA cost, which is uh, 240 by the budgeted car days. So the master budget for SNA is 240, we just so it, number of planned car days, as we know, is 30,000 car days. So we get a predetermined variable overhead allocation rate of $8 per car day. Now, the flexibly budgeted SNA cost is the budgeted $8, predetermined budgeted $8 per car day times the actual car days, because this is, the, this is how we would have budgeted the SNA cost had we known that we would sell only 25,000 car days rather than the planned 30,000 car days. So 8 times 25,000 gives you 200,000. And then, the flexibly budgeted variance is the difference between the actual and the flexible budget. And that gives you 70,000, of course, unfavorable because the actual is higher than flexibly budgeted. The activity variance is the difference between two budgeted figures, the master budget, and the flexible budget uh, gives you 40,000. And it is favorable because it, the only reason there's a difference between two budgeted figures is because the activity levels of the master budget is predicated on 30,000 and the flexible budget on 25,000. The fact that you sell less, less car days resulted in lower cost and that's favorable to the extent of $40,000. And let's change that. 
because we use master sta static and static and master budgets are used interchangeably. But since we use, I just don't want to. I'm not in the edit mode. Excuse me. Let's go to the edit mode. And um, oh, where were we uh, here? Yeah. So what we want to change. Master. The master budget variance is the actual minus the ma master budgeted, and that's 30,000 unfavorable. And of course, if you add the flexible budget to the activity variance, you get the master budget variance. So the only difference between those costs, the indirect costs and direct costs, is that you calculate a predetermined variable overhead allocation rate. But other than that, the definition of the variances are the same. Any questions? Now, if you want to expand uh, the overhead cost analysis of selling and administration, beyond the flexible budgeting also into standard costing, we could do that as well. And that's actually what we do next in the example. We do standard costing for SNA. So we establish a quantity or a quantitative standard for SNA. We ask uh, our administrative experts and together and our administration people and get together with top management and we figure what is a good target for the number of S selling and admin costs per car day rented. And we go through estimations and work analysis and so on. And uh, let's assume that in the end of the day we come with a target or a standard of 0 0.2 SNA hours per car day. So how much do we budget? How many SNA hours do we budget? If 0 0.2 SNA hours, and we plan 30,000 car days to be sold ahead of time, so we budget ahead of time 0 0.2 of 30,000, we budget 6,000 SNA hours per year. So it may be useful for us to calculate based on 60,000 SNA hours per year. We re really want to know how many people we have to hire, how many SA people we have to hire. That's a new location. So based on the 6,000 hours planned of SNA, uh, let's go to this line. We plan that each SNA worker will work seven hours a day times 20, hour, 20 days a month, times 11 months a year. One month goes for sick leaves and vacation. So it gives you about 1,540, about 1,500. So if you divide 6,000 by 1,500, you get that you really need to budget for four SNA employees. And then you need to budget for the standard, you need to target, put a standard for the compensation per person hour that you'll pay sales and administrative worker. And let's assume that human resources together with management decide on a target of $10. Okay? So then uh, you can calculate the number of SNA person hours required to serve 25,000 car days. That's the flexible. <clears throat> that would be four employees times 0.2 per car day times 25 
thousand car days actually sold, so that would give you 20 person, 20,000 person hours. So had you known that you would uh, sell 25,000 car days, you would have budgeted for 20,000 person hours. So the flexible budgeted SNA cost is 20,000 person hours times $10 per hour or $200,000 of flexibly budgeted SNA. Now, what is given in the story is that when you go into operate, when you uh, operate it, you actually use 21,000 person hours, actual person hours worked were 21,000. So your actual compensation per hour was the 270,000 actual person hours, uh, uh, 270,000 actual dollars of SNA costs divided by the actual number of SNA hours used, so your actual compensation was $12.86. When all these numbers are in, you're ready to compute the very VR, VAR stands for variance, OVH stands for overhead. The um, very VAR um, no VAR stands here for variable. That's no good because it so usually stands for variance. So remember that it stands for variable. Or let's let's do it differently. Variable. So not to be confused with variance. Variable OVH stands for overhead. Variable overhead price, which is often called the spending variance for variable o for overhead, is or price variance, is the actual price that you pay per person hour of SNA minus the standard, that's the deviation of the actual from the standard, times the actual number of person hours. That's how, remember, that's we said how the price variance is defined. So we get about six, we get $60,060 of variance. And of course, this price variance is designated as unfavorable. And the reason it's designated as unfavorable is very simple because it arises from the fact that we paid more, $12.86. We ended up paying more per SNA hour than we targeted. We targeted 10. We played, paid $12.86. We paid $2.86 more than our target or our standard, and therefore this has a negative impact on profits because in and of itself it causes higher SNA costs. So the variance is designated as unfavorable. Okay? Now, the variable overhead efficiency variance, the variable overhead efficiency variance, again, as defined, we compare the actual, uh, the actual SNA hours used to the standard for 25,000 car days. 21,000 is the actual, 20,000 is the standard. We exceeded the standard by 1,000 hours times the standard price, which is 10, the standard compensation, gives us $10,000 variance. And uh, the $10,000 variance is obviously unfavorable because by using more hours of an SAA, then we were targeted, then we then standard. Uh, that leads to higher SNA costs than 
we planned for, and that has a negative impact on profits. So we have the price variance or spending variance and the efficiency variance. And if we add them up the way they are defined, we get the, let's just make it variable. We get a variable overhead flexible variance. So that's an extension of standard costing analysis to variable overhead. But again, the principles and the definitions of the variance are the same for variable or indirect overhead as they are for the direct costs, which in our case were maintenance and the operation of the fleet. We could do also separately a component for depreciation separately if we wanted to, but uh, you, could, you could check it on yourself. We just didn't include it in the example. So that's basically it. So uh, just to sum up, which is true for direct variable cost and variable overhead is you can do flexible budgeting by having the master budget, the flexible budget, comparing them to the actual. And you can partition the master budget variance to its components, the flexible budget variance and the activity variance. And then you can go further and set standards for the components of each cost, the quantity of the input used, and the price per unit of the input bought or hired. And then, if you do that, you can further partition the flexible budget variance into a price variance and an efficiency variance. Where the efficiency variance is supposed to give you indications about the efficiency of the operation and the price variance, about the efficiency in which the inputs, the inputs underlying this particular cost component were used, and the price variance is supposed to give you an indication of uh, how much did you pay for the input relatively to what you planned or relatively to the standard that you set for paying that particular input. OK, any questions or comments? OK, our final, remember, we talked about direct costs. And we talked about indirect or overhead variable. But we didn't talk about fixed cost yet. So our final preoccupation today is going to be how we extend the budget and variance analysis to fixed, fixed overhead or capacity costs. And we'll stay with the car rental example where the capacity cost, the fixed cost or the costs of installing the capacity in this new car rental site, what does it represent? What kind of inputs it represents? And we said at the beginning, in order to put a car rental operation together, we need what in terms of capacity? Well, we needed a car fleet. We had taken care of it already, but we need uh, we need land and we need buildings. So we are, the capacity fixed costs are now 
in addition to the opportunity costs that we handled before are now the costs of the building and land. Well, let's assume, let's make it easy, let's assume that we lease the buildings and we lease the land. It's a new location. We're not sure whether we're going to be there for that long. We don't know how things will work out. So we decide to lease the buildings and to lease the land. So the story goes that uh, when we plan for those leases, we budget leases for building and land at $385,000 a year. And we end up actually paying, when we lease, 400000 Now, why do we lease? Because we want to have a capacity of handling cars, selling car days. So remember, our practical capacity was a fleet of 100 cars that we can rent, if there is a demand, we can rent up to 350 days, 365 days a year, minus minus days for maintenance and days for repair, 15, so it's 350. So we have 35,000 car days practical capacity. The master budgeted car days that we estimate that we are going to sell at 30,000, of course, we, we wound up selling 25,000. So, now the question is, well, let's, let's, let's do it one thing at a time. The obvious thing to do in terms of budget analysis is to compare, is to um, define a control budget variance for fixed costs and to compare the actual fixed cost incurred for the building of the land we had it at 40, 400,000, minus the planned one, or the budgeted one, 385,000. So in this case, we get that we have 15,000 over budget. And uh, <coughs> obviously, that's an unfavorable variance, because <coughs> it has an unfavorable impact on profits. And managerially, it's, you can strongly argue that that's the only variance that we should deal with in the analysis of fixed costs. Because all the other variances are based on differences in levels of activity and fixed costs don't vary with the level of activity. By definition, they're defined as fixed because in the short run, we, uh, the lease that we pay for the buildings and the land once we, we plan to pay is not going to be in the short run, in, next, in a year time, are not going to be dependent on how many car days we sell, whether we sell more or less. Now, if we consistently sell more than we can deliver, we may want, in the long run, we may want to expand our land and, and buildings and lease more or buy our own. But that's a much longer term decision. In the shorter run, and we talk about operating budgets over the next year, those are going to be fixed costs. So we could stop here and say that's that. But remember our discipline is accounting and in accounting we like to allocate everything. So, and not only accounting, let's not pick up on us accountants, we like to, business people also like to allocate because business people like to know how much, the, what is the full cost per unit Fully allocated cost per unit, how much does it cost me to produce this widget? 
that I'm selling and I want the full cost per unit. So there's a strong pressure to allocate fixed cost even if it doesn't make too much sense. Because why should you allocate, based on the number of units, a cost that doesn't vary with the level of activity? But if there is pressure to allocate and we need to allocate, and remember we'll talk about the fact that uh, GAP also requires to allocate fixed costs because in, uh, in disclosures, in the cost of goods sold, right? The cost of goods sold, FASB requires to include fixed cost as well. You cannot include only variable costs and not allocate the fixed. Fixed costs have to be allocated to the product. They cannot be treated as period costs. They have to be treated as product costs. So th there are many reasons managerial pressure, uh, disclosure pressure, where we have to allocate the fixed costs. So if we must do it, then we do it. So in order to do it, we define, in the budgeting stage, we define the predetermined fixed overhead allocation rate. And uh, one recommended way to use it is to take a ratio where in the numerator, where in the numerator we have uh, the budgeted fixed costs, remember, 385,000. And in the denominator, we have capacity because the budget, because the fixed costs are there to afford us a certain capacity. So we divide it by the practical capacity, which is 35,000 car days. Another way to do it is to divide it by the planned capacity, which is 30,000 car days. May may make more sense to divide it by 35,000 car days. That's what we do in this example. So 385 divided by 35,000 car days gets us a predetermined fixed overhead allocation rate of $11 per car day. Now we can calculate the flexible budget fixed costs, or sometimes they're called the applied fixed costs, by saying, look, had we known had we known ahead of time that we would sell 25,000 car days, we may have not chose to predicate our capacity of 35,000 or 30,000, but we would have predicated our capacity on 25,000 car days, and the capacity would be 25,000 car days times 11, which gives us $275,000, so we would have sought to have less building and less land, and we might have budgeted it for 275000 Had we known that the demand is going to be only 25,000 car a day. So we get, in that case, we get another variance, a production volume variance, which is the difference between uh, two budgeted figures. The first figure is the budgeted, is what we budgeted ahead of time based on 35,000 car days or 30,000 car days, whichever you want to use, and 275,000 is what would have, what we might have budgeted for had we known that 
we would only have to have capacity for 25,000 car days and the difference is the variance, $110,000 production volume variance, and the production volume variance is designated as unfavorable because had we known, because the fact that we sold less car days, the fact that we sold less car days means what? Means that our fixed capacity was divided by less car days, was there to serve less car days than we hoped, 25,000 car days rather than 30,000 or 35,000. So that's, so if you have fixed capacity serving less car days, so per car day, the cost of the fixed capacity is higher because you divided by less car days. And this higher cost has a negative impact on profits and that's why uh, you do, uh, you designate the variance as unfavorable. Now, because of the fact that you engage in all those, you, you're treating here, in the allocation, you're treating fixed costs as if they were variable, and actually they're not variable, then the uh, production volume variance is a very strange animal, and it's very strange to interpret what it really means. So basically, the more meaningful variance, as we said before, for fixed overhead is the control budget variance. But let's try to interpret it. Let's hope it makes sense, some sense. Uh, okay, let's try to read. That's the best that I could try. Production volume variance represents the difference between allocation of budgeted fixed cost based on planned capacity uh, production and what the allocation of budgeted fixed costs would have been had capacity been based on actual production activity. So it tells you that you could interpret it as saying it's the extra cost that you incurred by putting in capacity that is higher than you might have put in had you known that you would sell less units. Now, how useful is this number or this variance? It's up to you to judge, but uh, it's calculated because uh, we insist on allocating fixed cost to the products. Now, of course, the last sentence here is obvious. Production volume variance would, will not exist if fixed costs or would not, or would not exist, should be better English. Would not exist, it's grammatically more correct. Let's go back to would not exist uh, if, uh, uh, if fixed overhead costs were treated as period costs rather than product costs. Because if they were treated as period costs, just incurred for the period, they would have not been allocated to the units, to the units of the product. Well, in this case, service. Service and product are the same. Uh, the car rental, uh, the, the number of car days rented. So that's the story um, in terms of the allocation of fixed costs. And again, for managerial purposes, we may just uh, satisfy ourselves with this variance only and not try to allocate the fixed costs. All right, any questions? Yes.
Yeah, yeah, you use it for calculating cost of goods sold, except that for calculating cost of the goods sold, which you include in the disclosures in the annual reports, of course, in the income statement, you do only the actuals, because they're based after the fact on the actuals. So when you... Yeah, but no, but you calculate the... But the fixed... Well, actually, the fixed cost, we'll talk about it more, uh, specifically later in the course, but the fixed costs, the actual fixed costs are calculated to the number of, to the units produced, right? And whichever is sold, whichever portion is sold, uh, the fixed costs follow it to the cost of goods sold. And whichever portion remains in inventory, the portion of the fixed costs that are uh, allocated to the units in inventory remain in inventory until they are sold. Are you allocated to all the goods that are You are allocated to everything that is produced, and then a portion of it goes to inventory, right. and a portion of it goes so to cost of goods sold. Right, exactly. No, but the only reason I mentioned it, because the whole, uh, the whole requirement to allocate fixed costs uh, is partly based on a uh, gap. You need to do it for gap. But it is also other reasons because uh, because many managers want to have full cost allocation to know what's the fully allocated cost of the product. But given that uh, the pressure is already there, so it creeps into the budgeting process as well. But in the disclosures, it's based fully on actuals. Good point. Any other questions? Okay, I think that's what I wanted to cover in terms of budgeting. Let's talk about our future plans. We are not meeting on Thursday, as you know, but next week I'd like to open the class for whatever time is necessary uh, to review the assignments and the answers to the assignments, but I want it to be generated by you, so next class, I want you to initiate all questions that you want to be discussed in the assignments, and we're going to discuss them by class, because many of the questions, after you have done the questions and you looked at the answers, uh, I'm sure that many of them are obvious, but some of them may not be. So those who, those that remain in question, those that remain in question in terms of uh, even after you have looked at the answers posted, uh, please bring them in and we're going to discuss them. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, so we don't have to next Thursday, right? Okay. So, next Thursday is where is the time to bring in. By that time, you will have also answers to assignment four posted. And uh, please bring in. Uh, so, let's, let's make it, uh, it's up to you to distinguish. Whatever is clear is clear, but whatever needs uh, further discussion, bring it up, because I don't want to leave. I don't want you to leave anything iffy. Uh, so, if there are any gaps there, uh, we have time to discuss them. And it's um, and but remember, as I said, uh, uh, the questions on the exam are going to be very similar to the questions. So right, well, first of all, the, base, the basic idea is not the exam. The basic idea is the learning process. Don't leave anything that is unclear in the learning process. We'll, we'll discuss it further. But also, as a preparation for the exam, it's useful to clarify any problems or any questions that you have relative to the assignments. And we're, of course, also going to discuss the case. Okay, so see you next week.
Thank you.